Amen. Amen. Yeah, we'd like to welcome Nushin. She's joining us. I've been catching up. I, I, I think it's really wonderful that we've had the RCI on video so you can go back and catch up. But she, she's been uh, married to a Catholic quite a while and the children in the RCI and CCD and everything else. We're not RCI, the CCD program. And, and so it, we're trying to catch up a little bit here and there and, and uh, be able to have her come in. We're so grateful that you would be able to come. Oh, good. Wonderful. Did you get the last one? Oh, good. Good. Okay, good. Well, I appreciate that. That's the issues in the book. Read the chapters in the book. Well, I'll just hand you this one out, and then I won't forget afterwards. This, this is the schedule. So you have the, the month and the date, and that tells you the class, and that tells you the chapters we're looking at. So we'll be right now starting the chapter on Holy Communion. And this is going to be a real intense period because we're going to, and I'll give it a little more information ne ne probably next time, but Father, um, Father DeSalle gives the most incredible presentation I've ever heard on the Mass. He actually, he, he first started, I gave him the hour. Well, he went two. So then I gave him an hour and a half. And then, I mean, I don't give him, I mean, it's his class, but usually we meet for an hour. So anyway, we we finally went one time it was about two and a half, and I told you know I'm I'm army guy so I'm committed you start this time and that's what we do. So now I tell people it's a two hour class and it is and so we moved it back to seven. So please try to come at seven. He has developed and actually gave a five part series on the mass to the parish, which lasted five hours in total. You know so he's got a five hour version of this which tells you he has a lot of information to share. and But it's wonderful. Because if you're like me, I was very confused about the Mass. And you've got the missile, you got the missile at, and you don't know where you are. I actually tabbed one for a friend of mine. He was an Army guy. He said, would you tab it? So I tabbed it for him, one, two, three, four, so he could follow along. But Father DeSalle is going to give you the background of the Mass, the history of it, and then he's going to walk you through it. And... Father Cell is not the most, you know, really excitable guy. He's not like me. He's not real bubbly. But golly, he gets excited about teaching this class. It's the most, the, the most exciting I ever see him is when he talks about, I think, his favorite subject in the world. And that's the Mass. And he's one of the most proficient liturgists, someone performing a liturgy that I've ever seen. He really loves the Mass. He's been here a number of years. And everything that he has done in this building has been to make the mass more beautiful. So we got in a new speaker system. We have a new light system. The light used to be this kind of light. He went out and spent a gazillion, but we, we paid for it for LED lights now. Well, we were paying $10,000 every couple of years to change the light bulbs in the ceiling. I mean, architect, hello, you build a ceiling, we have to change the light bulbs. But we did. We had to get scaffolding, or we yeah, we built scaffolding. You go up and change the light bulbs. So we went out and he got LED lights. And now instead of it coming down like this, if you ever notice it, it looks like it glows from inside. The whole and and you can make make it brighter for different times. So the mass is the brightest of them all. And then when we have adoration, we have special lights just on on the Eucharist on the altar, and it, it's just amazing. So he's done that. Then he put the two big murals up of. St. Raymond's and on and on and on. Everything he's done is to make you walk in there and just feel the presence of God. This is God's house. This is not as we were doing in the 70s. Multi-purpose, multi-function. Uh, when we first moved here in 1980, Nativity had just been built. And it was multi, it, it, it wasn't anything. It wasn't pentagon, it wasn't hexagon. It was just odd shapes. It was mass in the round. You could have the altar in the middle and then chairs all around it. You could have the altar at this side and chairs on this side. Every week it was different. We took it down every week and had all the CCD in that one room with petitions. That's when it was, I had purgatory. I taught ninth grade, it was awful. And then, um, and then we'd have a dance on Saturday night. And after the dance, they'd turn it into the sanctuary by moving the altar back up. It was crazy. 
And Father Chulo came after that, and he just walked right in there and said, that's it. Designated the altar, put in marble. Now it looks like a church. But it was crazy. And that was the idea of multipurpose, multifunction. And and you lose the you lose the awe, aweness of mass. You should walk, the, the North X should be separate from the sanctuary. So we have doors, because that's what we do. We have a donut sale or whatever we have. Then the Knights of Columbus are selling something. And that's, you know. But once you go through those doors, you're in the presence of God and your eyes, it's transcendent, your eyes should immediately see the altar and the altar is the marble table. And right behind the altar is the tabernacle. And then your eyes should be elevated to the loftiness of God. And then it's a transept, it's, it's like a cross. So the whole thing is designed architecturally to bring you the spiritual posture that you want to be in when you come to a church. It shouldn't be just an all-purpose room. It should be different. And I, I took my favorite statement by a priest was, the church is the vestibule of heaven. You come from the world, you go into the church, you worship God, and you go back into the world. And that's why there should be bells and smells and candles and vestments and because it's it's the vestibule of heaven. It's as close as we're going to get in the Eucharist. Oh, so that's why Father is just amazing. That that's that class is just tremendous. So please try to come at seven next next week. Um, that's what this first chart is supposed to say. First of all, this is the chapter on twenty six. Okay, and then this is the Father Desel next Monday at seven. Now I want to do something a little bit, and and I, I don't, I don't really want to apologize. I want to explain, I guess, because I've been studying this for all my life, but because I've been teaching it for twenty years, and I'm really in love with the Bible itself, the totality, the totality of the Bible itself. I think it's important for, and I do this in Bible study, and I, I want to do it for the RCI because I think we've talked about it briefly before, but if I just jump in and talk about the Mass, not about, about the Eucharist, just it's another sacrament, it's the greatest, greatest sacrament, you'll get some information. But I want you to get a sense of what this is and where it came from. And I meant, I, grew, I was a Methodist, Grandfather's a Methodist minister. He taught me about Jesus and me. I loved it. I loved the singing. I loved his sermons. My dad was a really good Methodist. He taught me uh, Sunday school. It was just a wonderful experience of something different than the world with this human being like us and all things of sin called Jesus, who was my Lord and Savior. And I gave my life to Jesus like you do at a Billy Graham crusade. And, you know, that, that was it. It was wonderful. It was but I didn't know where it all came from. I didn't know the Old Testament. I'd studied a little bit of it. I didn't know the 1800 years that led up to Jesus moment in the Jewish community and their life and what they were worshiping and how they were worshiping and what he did to change it. And that change is still here today, 2000 years later. It's the only institution, human institution that's existed and not been completely and totally toppled in the world. It's 2,000 years of practicing something that this Jewish rabbi, this carpenter from Nazareth, who just happened to be the word of God made flesh, which is the most significant and important moment in history, the birth of Christ at Christmas, gave us what we're going to study tonight was an opportunity to receive him in a tangible way for the rest of history. And what goes on in the mass is, is really, if we really understood it, I don't think we could go. Thankfully, we don't understand it completely. It's, it's just more than you can just imagine. But how did it get there? So quickly, I'll go through a few charts. And I don't want to bore you with a lot of details, but it's important to understand who the Jewish people were, because Jesus was a Jew. And he was living in the time of Judaism that was prophesied would be 
when the when the Messiah, the anointed one, the king, the king of the Jews, the king of Israel would come and restore the great kingdom of David. That's that was the time they were living. In. And he came and they missed it. And it's unfortunate, but we didn't. And who what he did, it was amazing. So going back very, very quickly, 1800 years before Christ, a man had a covenant with God. His name was Abraham. Abraham and God developed a covenant. God promised him three things. You'll have a descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. Uh, I'll give you boundaries of a land mass that will belong to your descendants. And from your descendants will come one who will unify the whole world under me, the true God. So those three promises to Abraham. Fast forward. He has a son. That son has two sons. One of those sons has 12, and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. After about 100 and some years, those 12 tribes ended up in Egypt for a variety of reasons. A wonderful story in the Old Testament about Joseph and all. So they're down in Egypt. And they stayed there 430 years. The whole nation of Israel, the whole descendants of Abraham, the people, the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of, of Israel, the sons of Jacob, were in Egypt. And they, they became Egyptianized. They, they worshipped the Egyptian gods. There was 2,000 Egyptian gods, and they were all pagan statues and that sort of thing. They the Nile, the sun, and all that. So a pharaoh, who was the king of the Egyptians, recognized that this group of people, which is growing like mad, was living amongst them in their community. So you got a, you got a state boundary, Egypt, and when one part of it, Gershom, there were hundreds of thousands of Hebrews living there, shepherds mainly. And if I'm, an, if I'm a king, I know that there's a danger to have another people living among my people, especially if there's ever a war with somebody else. So let's say the Assyrians wanted to attack the Egyptians. Let's say the Hebrew people wanted to be supporters of the Assyrians. Egypt would have a real problem. You have 500,000 armed men living in your country being supported by an outside. So that, that was the fear. So the Pharaoh said, well, we'll just enslave them. We'll make them so work so hard they'll, they can't join anybody else. And that's what they did. So Israel became completely and totally slaves of the Egyptian Pharaoh, and they were living in misery because they were tasked beyond their capability. They weren't given any help. They were second-class citizens. It was terrible. So out of this time comes a guy named Moses and the whole story of Moses and how he was saved and so on. Because the, the Pharaoh said, you must kill all, all Hebrew males are to be put to death. They're to be thrown into the Nile to drown. And you may keep the females because if you keep the females and the Egyptians marry them, the Egyptians will inherit the land that belongs to the Hebrews. That was the argument. So you kill all the males because they could fight against this. But keep all the females because that way we can intermarry with them and we'll take the land back. That was the plan. So anyway, they cry out. Moses is selected. God hears their cry. And he tasks Moses to lead them out of Egypt to the promised land that had been promised to, right? Abraham. So that's where they were about 1250 B.C. And at the most significant event, there were 12 plague, or 10 plagues. And the last plague, they had all kinds of things that ruined the land and ruined, poisoned the water, did everything so that the Pharaoh would let them go. And he kept saying, no, 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 no. And finally, on the night of the Passover, Moses was told by God, this is what you're going to do. Every family is going to select a lamb, small lamb, six months old. You're going to ritually sacrifice it, called kosher. They hang it upside down so that the blood draw, runs out, so there's no blood in the animal. You're going to roast it. This is all going to happen in one night. And then you're going to roast it with your, your clothes on, with your sandals on your feet, with your staff in your hand. Men who wore long skirts, they call it girding your loins. They would pull up their skirt and tie it around their waist so they were sort of like in Bermuda shorts. But they can walk faster. You can't walk in a formal skirt. You women all know that, how hard it is to go to a formal dance. And one of the, Well, that's the way the men's clothes were. So they girded them. And the idea was that the angel of death sent by God would pass over every house that had taken the blood of the lamb that they were going to eat and put it on their doorpost. 
And that was a sign that there was a Hebrew living in that house and the angel of God would pass over. And everyone else among man and all animals, the firstborn died that night. Now, if you ever want to think about it, think in your family, firstborn male, think of your family who was firstborn. Do you have a firstborn son? Do you, was your husband a firstborn? I was a firstborn. My father was a firstborn. My grandfather's. All firstborn were killed in one night. And that's what caused Pharaoh to let them go. So they fled, and then there's a long story, and they end up, they end up Mount Sinai. Now, God had, had hoped that the Hebrew people would be true to him, but we've just seen they spent 400 years worshiping the Egyptian gods. So now he's going to give them a set of rules. So the first five books of the Bible contain what the Jewish people call the law, the Torah. And every one of the times it says, do this or don't do that, they recorded it. By the time Jesus was on the earth, the Pharisees had counted 613 rules and regulations that they said Moses was given by God to live by to make him happy. Now, all kinds of bad things happened. God took care of them. He gave them the land. He gave them everything. He was taking care of them militarily. And suddenly they wanted a king like everybody else. All our neighbors have a king. We want a king. So God said, okay, you can have a king. So they had and it was Saul. He wasn't a very good king. Then you have David. David was a great king, and his son Solomon was even greater. And they were the superpower of the world in about 11th century BC. And very, very powerful. But then they started worshiping other gods, just the first commandment. God gave them 10 commandments. We looked at them. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other God besides me. What did they do? They went out worshiping pagan gods. What did God do? He punished them. So fast forward. At Mount Sinai, God said, this is how you worship me. I'm going to set up my tent among your tents. Tabernacle. God dwelling among his people. God's present among his people. So there, you have a tent, you have a courtyard. Everything was given by dimensions, by exact size and everything. And what you, how you worship. And you give animal sacrifices. This is a barbecue pit here. And this is where you offer lambs just like you did Passover. So the lamb will take my place. If I want to offer a sacrifice, I can't offer my son. I mean, that would be unhuman, but I could buy a lamb and offer that lamb for my son, or I could offer that lamb for my sins, or I could offer that lamb in thanksgiving to God. God would be grateful when I give a lamb or other animals, and the way that it would be, it'd be burned up, and the, and the gift is the life of the lamb was taken when the blood was let go, and the lamb itself was consumed and gone up to heaven in the smoke. That was the way you worship God. And they did that from this time, 1250 BC, all the way up to the time of Christ, it was still going on. So later on, they, instead of having this tent move around with them as they moved around for 40 years in the desert, Solomon built a bigger version of that exact same tent. Dimension wise, it's just bigger. Exact same things, an inner sanctum and outer sanctum. You had the Holy of Holies where God would come and dwell. And this would give you an idea of the veil of the temple. You know, it says that when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was torn. It was like that. It's a massive thing. And then that was torn down by the Babylonians, and Herod rebuilt it at the time of Christ. That was under construction for 60 years at the time of Christ. That's the temple Jesus went to. And it was in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. And this is the altar. And so they would bring animals, they would kill the animals, and they would bring them up, and they would put them in this fire, and that would be the offering given up to God. At the same time, inside the temple, they would offer incense, morning, first, first in the morning, like six, and then first in the, last in the evening, like six. So twice a day, they offered incense to God, and they offered an animal to God, along with all the other sacrifices that were going on individually. So this is the way they worship. This is the way Jesus grew up. Here's a lamb. And why don't I show you that picture? What do we call Jesus? What did John the Baptist call him? The Lamb of God. What did Jesus do? Why is this so significant? Because this lamb was supposed to take my sins, and I would slay the lamb, blood would be poured out, would burn him up on the incense, he could go up to God, and God would forgive his sins. That's the way you offer sacrifice. We don't do that anymore anymore, right? We don't, you don't come here on Sunday. We don't offer lambs. There's no burnt offering. 
But Jesus, by dying on the cross, shed his blood, gave up his life as an offering to his Father for all of our sins forever. And that's what we're going to remember every time we go to Mass. We reenact. It's not, it's not like the reenactment at, at Manassas when they have the battle. It's not a reenactment. It's a representation. Because God is beyond time. He can make something happen today that happened 2,000 years ago, but it's really happening. It's the exact thing happening 2,000 years ago is now happening today. So he's moving the passion at Easter up to our participation in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and in the Last Supper every time we have Mass. It's not a representation. It is our participation in it. He's, it's, it's just an amazing event. And so Jesus becomes the Lamb of God because he dies as the last and final Holocaust or sacrifice of a human being, of a, of a, a human life or not a human life, but of life, his is the most important ever, and once done, never been repeated. All right, this is a synagogue. So they didn't, they only went to temple because the temple was in Jerusalem. If you live in Nazareth, you had to go to the temple three times a year, but you didn't go every Sunday. So you worship in your local synagogue. And there it was a prayer service. Basically, they read Psalms, sang Psalms. They would read from the scripture. They'd have scrolls from the Old Testament. Someone would open it, read it, and someone would give a discussion or a homily. Of it. That's how they worshiped normally. But three times a year, they had to go to a six or seven day feast in Jerusalem. Okay, so that's the background. So fast forward to the time of Christ, and he is going to institute the Eucharist. I'm going to give you the background of that in a second. Now, the Mass, in the Mass, we celebrate the sacrament, one of the seven sacraments. Last time we talked about seven sacraments. This is the sacrament called the Eucharist. Eucharist is a Greek word for thanks. So it's a thanksgiving sacrifice called the Eucharist. And it is perfected during a religious liturgy we call the Mass. So every time there's a Mass, there's one every day. And on Sundays, there's multiple, seven or eight on a weekend. And it's the same Mass offered in the same way before the Second Vatican Council. It was in Latin everywhere in the world. If you traveled, if you got on a plane and you went to Paris and you walked into a church on Sunday, it was in Latin. You knew exactly what was going on. But because it was in Latin, a lot of people weren't paying any attention. They go to Mass and it was in Latin. They didn't pay any attention. So the Second Vatican Council said you can do it in the vernacular of the nation. So now the Mass is in English. You understand what's the prayer so You can hear it. But the same Mass is being said in Rome in Latin, and it's exactly the same. It's a trans Ours is a translation of the Latin Mass that's being said in Rome. So the whole church is saying the same Mass every day for daily mass and every weekend, and everyone is asked to go on a Sunday, it's Sabbath. So you can go Saturday evening after sunset all the way through the whatever masses are offered on Sunday. Once a week, we go and we worship God. We adore God, and that's what we do it in the mass. And we'll talk about the parts. There's two parts, and Father will give all the explanation. He'll tell you what all the prayers are. It's wonderful, but I want you to understand, it is the sacrifice of Christ Without blood, a representation, not a reenactment. It is Jesus offering himself in the sacrifice. And then we offer ourselves as the sacrifice. Because what, what, what an offering was in the Jewish tradition is the lamb would, would represent you. I can't afford for me to die every time for my sins. So if I buy a lamb, it's expensive. The lamb is taking on my sacrifice. I'm giving the lamb to God for me. So the lamb is my sacrifice. So in the mass, Jesus is offering himself to the Father as a sacrifice, and he's also taking us as we offer ourselves in sacrifice without doing it physically. We believe, when I was a Methodist, I always 
We always talked about this. We've said it a thousand times, and I believe it's still true now. When two or three of us are gathered together in prayer or anything, if we're gathered together in a religious setting, Jesus is in our midst. He promised us that. It's in Matthew's gospel. Two or three are gathered together in my name. I'm in their midst. So I always assumed that there was a spiritual presence of Jesus in our midst, like there is now. In this class, Jesus is present in a spiritual form as we have this discussion. But what happens in the mass is it's tangible. When I went to communion as a Methodist, it was a piece of bread, normally Welch's, imagine, you know, I mean, Welch's grape juice and Wonder Bread. Nice little pieces of white bread and a little shot glass of Welch's grape juice. But it was symbolic. Remembrance. Jesus said, remember, do this in remembrance of me. So the Protestants say, I will remember, I remember what happened 2,000 years ago. And I'm going to remember it by taking a little, little grape juice because prohibition caused the Methodists not to drink wine, Baptists too, and have a little bread. But that's not what we believe. We believe what happened at the Last Supper, Jesus' words at the Last Supper, had a significant tangible meaning. And I want to read a couple of verses, a couple of passages to you. But they had a significant meaning of what is actually happening in the Mass and how it's tangible. So I'm not drinking well, it's just grape juice. Well, I very rarely, because that's another reason we don't do both species, but that's for health reasons. But when I take a, when I consume the Eucharist that has become a little wafer that's become the body, blood, soul, and the of Jesus Christ, I'm not consuming a wafer. I am actually consuming Jesus. I'm making him a part of me. It's physical. It's tangible. It's on my tongue. It's in my stomach. It's in my body. Jesus becomes a part of me in a real sense during the mass because that's what he promised he would do. So let's look at that real quick. All right, so Jesus gave it the teaching the night before the crucifixion. He was crucified on Good Friday. The Eucharist was instituted on Holy Thursday at the Last Supper. Now, I've given you all kinds of references. All I want you to do with these references is if you get time, you want to read them, read them. I'm giving you all kinds of background references. Those charts are just, just information for you to use if you have time. But let me read you something from John 6. And this is what I want. Very, very few people really see it this way, but let me let me um, let me read this passage to you. So let me tell you what happened first. The night, the, the, the day before Jesus fed five thousand, this is John's version of the of the multiplication of the loaves. So he feeds five thousand men, women, plus women and children. There are twelve baskets left over. It's in Matthew's gospel. It's in all the gospels. So John tells us about the feeding of five thousand. Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray after he dismisses the crowd. The apostles get in a boat and they go back across the lake. There's a storm. In the middle of the night, Jesus sees that they're in trouble and he comes down and walks across the lake on the water to rescue them from the storm. Now, in Matthew's gospel, Peter actually asks if he could walk on the water too and he doesn't know that. But that's what's happened. You've had the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus is walking on the water. It's the next morning. And what's happening? The people from the feeding of the 5,000 had come back to this major city, Capernaum, and they were in the synagogue the next day. And Jesus was there. So this is a discussion. This was a dialogue between Jesus and these Jews, these, well, many of them Pharisees, who had been fed by the multiplication of the loaves the day before. And they're now in the synagogue where they meet, that little house that I just showed you, at Capernaum. And it's in John chapter 6, verse 25. So they said, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi. Now, when, they, when John talks about a people addressing Jesus as Rabbi, they are not believing he's the son of God. Rabbi means teacher. Now, he was a rabbi. He was a traveling rabbi. He gave, just like a lot of rabbis, he had disciples that followed him, and he went around and preached. So here was, that's who they thought he was. 
So they get across the river. He's back in the St. and he said, Rabbi, when, when did you come here? Now, Jesus answered, and whenever John says, truly, truly, that is a very, very important passage to follow. Whenever you see that, think of something big is going to happen. So Jesus answered them. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me. You're looking for me. Not because you saw the signs, not because you saw me make 12 loaves of bread and do enough to feed all 5,000 of you. That's not why. But because you ate of your full of the loaves, you got a free meal. You're, you want some more food. That's what he says to them. You, not because of the signs, but because you ate your full of the loaves. Do not labor for food which perishes, but for food which endures to eternal life. Now, you're a Jew. You're sitting there. You've just witnessed this guy feed 5,000 people. You were one of them. You don't exactly know how he got over here because all the boats left, but here he is. And you're really interested, and he's telling you, don't seek food like you had yesterday, which you ate, and it's gone. But seek food which doesn't perish, but it, it endures until eternal life. That's the next life. That's shoal. That's where the dead go. How can I eat bread that goes in the next life? And he said, but for the food which endures in eternal life, which the Son of Man, that's the name he called himself. It's a long story about that. Which the Son of Man will give you. For to him, for on him has God the Father, that's the Father that the Jews worshipped. Yahweh was God, God the Father. They didn't have really, they didn't have the Trinity. They didn't know he, Jesus was God. So that was their true God, the one true God. He said, on him, God the Father has set his seal. Seal is a sign of authority. Remember, the king would put seal in a wax to seal a letter. So the signet ring was authority. So he's saying, Jesus is saying, I, son of man, will give you for on me, God the Father, who you worship, has set his seal. He has given me authority to do this. Now, we think he's a rabbi. We know he, he's Jesus, son of Joseph. Both are carpenters. I have a table in my house made by Jesus. What? And, and now he's saying he has the seal of God? Listen. Then he said to them, what, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the work of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Implied, believe in me. That's what Jesus said. So they said to him, then what sign? Sign means miracle. What trick will you perform? Do magic. So they said, what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. That's the food that they had in the desert for years. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So that's their challenge to Jesus. They just seen him feed 5,000 people. They figured he walked across the lake. Now they want another sign. Then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This is really foreign stuff. I don't see what they thought. They said to him, Lord, now they think he's master. Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, here it is. I am the bread of life. By the way, the word Yahweh, Yahweh was a forbidden word. You could not say it, so to God. Yahweh means I am who am. So every time you see I am in John's gospel, Jesus is saying the holy name, which was forbidden. We read it in English and said, oh, he just said, I am. No, that was blasphemy. So he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And him who comes to me, I will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven. I've come down from heaven. Not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me, Yahweh. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing 
of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Then the Jews murmured. This is exactly what they did when they came out of Egypt. They murmured. I, I use the B word, but I don't want to be impolite. They were grumbling. They were not happy. The Jews murmured at him. And, and because he said, I am the bread which has come down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say that he has come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except him who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me will have eternal life. We hear this now, but you never would have heard that in the first century. And then he says this. I am, again, Yahweh, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the desert, in the wilderness, and they died. But this is the bread which comes down from heaven, and a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread who came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread which I shall give you uh, for the life of the world is my flesh. Greek sarks. This sounds like and was believed to be cannibalism. He was telling them that they were going to eat his flesh. Then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I tell, say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Who has eats my flesh and drinks my blood? abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of Father, so he who eats me will be, live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. And this he said in the synagogue as he taught them at Capernaum. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Jesus, knowing in himself that he was disciples were murmuring, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if I would, you were to see the man, son of man ascending where he was before? It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I've spoken to you are my spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who was going to betray him. And then he says this to the disciples. This is why I told you, I mean the apostle, this is why I told you no one can come to me unless it's granted by the Father. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went with him. Jesus said to the 12, will you go also? The 12 are the 12 apostles, starting with Peter. They've been with him for three years. Will you go also? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, Kyrios, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed. We've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered him, I did not, did I not choose you, the 12, and one of you is the devil? And he spoke of Judas. That's the bread of life discourse in John's gospel. The apostles had no idea what he was talking about. How do we eat the flesh of Jesus? How do we drink his blood? How is this possible? What's going on? Then you shift over to Matthew. Chapter 26, at the Last Supper. After the Passion, we got to go through the whole Passion. Just before, I mean, it's just before the Passion. This is, we've come down from Jerusalem. We've had Palm Sunday. We're in the upper room. He's giving all this information. And then he says this. Now, as they were eating, what were they eating? The Passover meal. How were they eating it? Just like everybody else did every Passover since the time of Moses. With their sandals on their feet, the staff in their hand, girded their loins. They ate bitter herbs because they didn't have time to cooked nice vegetables. They had unleavened bread because they were going to have to flee the next morning. It was a reenactment of the Passover meal. Jesus and his 12 were having the Passover meal on, at the Last Supper. 
And he says to them, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. Blessed, said the blessing, Eucharist, thanksgiving. Blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, quote, take, eat this, this bread, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, Eucharist, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That is the consecration that the priest says, using the first person, because he is in the person of Christ. Father DeSalle will say those words, and he uses the word, this is my body. It's not Father DeSalle's body, and Father DeSalle's not saying it. It's Jesus' body, and Father DeSalle's in the person of Christ, in persona Christi, is saying the words that Christ said at the Last Supper, and at that moment, the body, that the bread and the wine have a substantial change. The substance changes. It goes from bread and wine to the body, blood, soul, and divinity, and we consume it just like John wrote about in John 6. And now it's being described in every one of the Gospels, and even Paul, who doesn't even meet Jesus, recites the exact same words of the consecration from the Last Supper. That's what we're celebrating. We are fulfilling John 6. Jesus said, you have to eat my body and drink my blood. How do I do that? You do it because the Eucharist, at the Eucharist, the host that have been all over the world, every time those words are said by an ordained priest with the authority of the signet ring of the church, the authority of the church, because he's got through holy orders, been selected by a bishop and been confirmed, been, uh, uh, he's a, a, a ordained he can say those words, and at that moment, that wine and those hosts become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. You go up, you kneel down, priest holds up the host and says, this is the body of Christ. And what is your answer? Amen. What does amen mean? I believe. Why do we ask Protestants not to come up to communion? Because they can't say that. As a Methodist, I didn't believe that. When I went, I had a piece of bread. It was bread. I had a bit of wine or juice. It was juice. I did it to remember what Jesus did for the Last Supper. We don't do that. We actually participate in the Last Supper at every Mass. And we believe it because we believe those words take the bread and wine in their substance and turn them into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Thomas Aquinas described it this way. We use the word transubstantiation. The problem is we don't speak the way Thomas Aquinas spoke in the 15th century. If I ask the average teenager, what is an accident? They'd say car crash. And if I ask the average teenager what they thought um, a substance was, they would say drug abuse. But what Thomas knew is that the substance is the actual essence of a thing. And the accidents are the thing that make it kind of unique and they can change. My hair once was, surprisingly, brown. That's the accident. The color of my hair is the accident that applies to me. It's now gray. So there's been a change in the accident. But I'm still the same substance. My sub I'm still Bob Ward from birth. My eyes are blue. That's an accident. That's one of the accidents of blue eyes. So what Thomas said is what happens at the consecration is the bread and wine remain from the accident point of view the same. It's still red, tastes like grapes, still white. 
tastes like unleavened bread. The accidents don't change. But the substance, the actual essence of what it is through the consecration goes from a host and wine to the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So I am fulfilling John 6. I am eating the flesh of Jesus Christ. I am drinking his blood. And he is becoming a part of me. So when I go to mass, I'm receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Not spiritually, not just sort of feeling, not just sort of, but physically, tangibly, I'm consuming it. And ideally, I say this with a lot of sarcasm, you try to keep that spirit of Christ within you beyond the parking lot. You don't want to lose your temper at the parking lot. Somebody will cut you off. So try to at least get out of the parking lot with Christ in you. That's what we do. We go to mass. We leave the world. We go to the vestibule of God, of heaven. We receive Jesus. We make him a part of us. And we carry him to the world. We go back out into our neighborhood. We go back to our families. We go back to our neighbors. But now Jesus is a part of us. Does that make sense? It's truly amazing. So that's what I want to share. So these other charts give you some background if you want. Um, again, right after feeding the 5,000, which is to pass over 12 baskets left over, giving thanks means Eucharist. Jesus walked on the water. Again, I am means ego ami, which is the holy name. I am who am Yahweh. It was forbidden to be used. Jesus used it all the time. What does that say? He was God. Discourse at Capernaum, it's in John chapter 6, verse 32 to the end. So he called, up, called them to believe in him. They misunderstood. He clarified his message. He calls them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Bread equal the, the manna and the quail that God provided the people when they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Wine was like God providing them water from the rock in the desert. The word, Greek word, Estio. People ask you, what do I do with it? Should I just lay it on my tongue and let it melt? The word for eating here is trogo, which means to chew. A cow trogos her, her, her cut. You, you want to eat it. Don't just let it sit on your tongue. Chew it. Eat it. That's what. And by the way, a lot of people feel very... It's a very holy moment in mass. You'll, learn, you'll see a lot of Catholics and they do it. It's a, it's a very pious act. And it it's, seems like a really the right thing to do, but it's not. Right at the time of the consecration, the priest will hold it up. The old, he's, it, you know, this is, he, hold, he holds up the Eucharist. Or he holds up the Eucharist in it. And most, many people that bow their head real it. Oh, I can't look at it. Well, why does he hold it up? Because he wants you to see it. So look up at that moment. That's the moment you can adore Christ. When he holds up the consecrated host, behold the Lamb of God, he holds that up, or the, when he holds them up, the Lamb of God, behold, this is the Jesus. When he holds it up, look at that's what you, that's what we've come to worship. That's really the true presence of God tangibly in that moment. And what do we do when it's over? We repose it where? We repose it in the tabernacle, a little gold box behind the altar, which is locked, and the church is locked to protect it, because the body, blood, soul, and divinity that is not consumed in the mass is reposed in that tabernacle. And what does tabernacle mean? God living among his people. When God was living in the tent, the tabernacle was, the, was the, inside the tent. When they built the temple in Jerusalem, the tabernacle was in Jerusalem. So if you were in Nazareth and you want to go and be in the presence of God, you went to Jerusalem. Where do we go? Any Catholic church in the world. And when you walk in, you're going to see a red candle lit 24 hours a day that says Jesus is present in the tabernacle. You can go sit, stand or kneel and talk to Jesus because he's in the tabernacle. And when we when we expose it for like on Saturdays, Fridays and Wednesdays, we put it in a monstrance and we set it on the altar and you can look and see this host who you know 
is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And I can talk to him like I'm talking to you. And, and if you listen, he will he won't say words you'll hear, but you'll you'll get messages. You'll you you can communicate. Prayer is just talking to God. If you really want to talk to God, go in the Eucharist exposed. Talk to him at mass. Say thank you when he's elevated. This is the body of Christ. Thank him. He's that's where he is. In every single Catholic church in the world. It's amazing. It's it the whole thing is feeding the 5,000, multiplication of the loaves is an awesome, tangible, amazing physical event, but it's only a taste of what happens in the Eucharist worldwide every day. You want to talk to Jesus? He's there. He's over there right now. And you can receive him on Sunday when you come in the church and you can make him a part of you. It's really amazing. So these other charts, as I said, a lot of information, but I don't need to go through it all. Again, choice of bread and wine, something very common. Very Everybody has bread and wine in the whole world. It's hard to, to imagine Jesus uh, would have used some kind of metaphor. People say, oh, that's a metaphor. He didn't really mean that. Why would he tell us that the night before he died? It's not a metaphor. It's, it's the truth. John 6 happened. Matthew 26 is how he instituted it. He didn't call him back. Remember, every once in a while, the, he would he would perform, um, he he talk in parables, and then the apostles would go back to the house. He'd go back, they were living at Peter's house in Capernaum. And they'd say, Jesus, we didn't understand the parable. What does that mean? And he'd explain it. Why did he not have to explain this thing when he said, this is my flesh, this is, he eat this, this is my flesh, this is my blood, drink it. Why wouldn't he have explained if it was a metaphor? He could have said, oh, no, guys, just that's a metaphor. No, no, I, I don't mean it. I mean, symbolically, you receive it. No, he said, will you guys walk away? How about you 12? I've worked with you special. I've given you everything. You're, you're my closest guys. You want to walk away? He didn't explain it. He said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. That's explained at the Last Supper. It's truly amazing. All right. Form and matter, the others. The form are the words the priest uses. The matter is the bread and wine. We talked about transubstantiation, trans meaning change of substance, a substantial change. By the way, Jesus is the priest. I wanted to sell this human priest, but Jesus is the priest and he's the sacrifice. The priest speaks in the person of Christ. When you go to confession, it's Jesus who hears your confession and who forgives you. The priest is doing so in the person of Christ. When the priest reads the gospel, it's Jesus reading the gospel. I can't read the gospel at mass. I'm a layman. Only a priest can speak in the in the person of God, of Jesus. Eucharist uh, is a sacrament of union. All right, consecrated host stay as long as they exist. And we talked about different ceremonies that we can have. Jesus commanded that this be continued forever. And he gave it through the authority of holy orders to bishops who were followers of the apostles and their helpers, priests. We call it the mass because in Latin, it is, we end it by saying, ite misa est, meaning you're dismissed. They took the word misa and they've named the mass after that word. So that's what mass it comes from. All right, these are some places that you can see the Old Testament. If you wanna read about Moses, Bring in the new Exodus. It's in Exodus chapter 2 through 34. And that's where you get the plagues and all the background. Psalm 51 gives you a lot of information about the Eucharist. Exodus 16 talks about what happened to Moses. The Messianic banquet. It is a banquet. It is a meal. You can see that referenced in Isaiah, Proverbs, and Psalms. You also see it in Exodus and Psalms. So these are just references. Mark talks about feeding of 5,000. Mark 8 talks about feeding of 4,000. And then all the multiplication low stories are there for you. you go back and read to get this, the scriptural basis for it. Other Eucharistic references in the New Testament, you can find in Mark, Matthew, Luke, Acts, and Corinthians. And of course, the wedding feast of the Lamb, which is in Revelation, is the image of heaven being the heavenly banquet. 
That's in Revelation. So that's where we were going. I would be happy to answer any questions to the group or individually. Next week, you'll get this in spades. This is a background. This is a biblical idea. He will tell you things about the mass that's just wonderful. I mean, it's just, it is the most amazing thing that can happen. God comes among us and gives us the ability to receive him, to make him a part of us so that we can go out and share that love with everybody we meet because everybody is created in the image and likeness of God. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And when you really get this, it's hard to really get. I still get angry at the other drivers. I still lose my temper. I still do those things. But in my heart, I know we're all part of this magnificent gift that God gave us at birth and baptism. When you're baptized, you're a part of this community. You have the opportunity to share in the Eucharist. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you all so much for coming, and I will see you next week, 7 o'clock, in the church. Just come in, go down to the front on the left-hand side. We'll be up there close. He'll put up a little podium, and he'll talk to you right real close, okay? And if you have to be late, come anyway. Come even if you come at the last one. Come and hear him talk. God bless you. See you, see you next week. Oh. My son is going to bring my daughter. Oh, good. That'll be wonderful. I look forward. She'll enjoy it.